lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Today, we are going to explore how to make your new garden feel older. Back when I first started gardening, I remember learning with a little sense of frustration the old adage about perennials, the first year they sleep, the second year they creep, and the third year they leap. I remember thinking, three years? Really? I'm not an especially patient person, so this three-year revelation was a definite downer to the grand plans I had for my first garden in front of my porch. Like every gardener on planet Earth, I didn't want to wait. I wanted an instant garden. I wanted it to be lush and stunningly beautiful that very summer. I wanted plants springing up in crevices and pathways edged with moss. I wanted ground covers to channel their inner flash gordon. I wanted my baby clematis to climb like Spider-Man to the tippy top of the trellis. I wanted to harvest a bushel of strawberries by the 4th of July. I wanted the garden to feel solid with elements of stone and wood, comfortable with hammocks and cushioned furniture, and inviting with the sounds of water and birds and insects and frogs. What I wanted right off the bat is the way only established gardens make you feel. And now it's happening. My garden is almost 20 years old, and I'm over 20 years wiser. The years of work in this garden have paid off, so much so that despite being late returning to the garden this spring after my rotator cuff surgery, the garden in large part carried on just fine. Of course, there were weeds and a few structural repairs needing my attention, but the bones of the garden and the good plant selections continue to reward this recuperating gardener and mother of four teenagers. I am grateful. And that got me thinking about what I would have told my younger gardening self all those years ago. Could I have gotten to this place sooner? Are there strategic choices I could have made to create this sense of age and lushness? I think the answer is a resounding yes. And that's what today's show is all about, making history, how to make your new garden feel older. And it's coming up after an update on the listener community for the show and this week's Garden News Roundup. But first, I'd like to start out by saying thank you for listening to the Still Growing Podcast this week. In fact, I hope you're listening to a bunch of gardening podcasts on your playlist every week. It's such a great way to grow and learn as a gardener. And truly, I'm sincerely honored that you're spending some time here listening to the show. I'd also like to invite you to join the listener community. It's a private, free Facebook group that I host for listeners of the show. These folks are made up of gardeners of all skill levels and locations. They're from all around the world. And you can find it on Facebook by typing the name of our group into the search bar. Just search for Still Growing Podcast Group. And the listener community will show up at the top of the search results in Facebook. Now, let me share some of the benefits of being in the group with you. This is a little list of tempting gardener benefits for you to consider. First, by joining the group, you'll have great garden articles that I curate for you that will just automatically appear in your Facebook newsfeed. In fact, you know, one way that you can make what you see on Facebook more customized to your interests is to join groups on Facebook that focus on topics you're interested in. So if you'd like to see more helpful posts about gardening, then by all means, join the listener community for the show. Second, this Facebook group, this listener community, is the only place I go to pick lucky listeners for any show giveaways. 
Third, you get to interact with the great guests that have been on the show. In fact, anytime I interview a guest of the show, part of my process is to invite them to join the group, and most of them do. So you can interact with great guests that have been on, everyone from Frau Zenny, Jen McGinnis, to Pam Pennick, the author of The Water Saving Garden, Shelley Cram, the author of The Gardener's Bible, Bree Arthur, she was just on and we were talking about her brand new book, The Foodscape Revolution. And that's really what I envisioned when I created the listener community is that it was a gift for you guys as listeners, a place where if you heard something on the show that you were interested in learning more about, that you could interact with the guests that had been on the show and ask them questions directly. And then finally, of course, I promise no spam. In fact, the content that I share with my listener community is something I work really hard to make sure is helpful and worthwhile for you. Everything I post is curated with you in mind to help you and your garden grow. Plus, it's free and easy to join. This week, I'd like to welcome the following new members, Brevard Smith, Eva Blandino, Bree Arthur, Mandy Pratt-John, Beverly Oaks, Anne Petruzzi, Karen Osborne Zigas, Jennifer Timmons, Patty Kraft, Shannon Moffat, Esther DeWaters, Amba Lee Coltman, Ismail Ruiz, Joey Emmerich, Natalie Iturba, and Joe Dombeck. Welcome, you guys. There were lots of great posts in the still growing podcast group this week, the listener community. First up, I shared a post on last week's episode all about basil mania. That's episode 573, and it covered everything from the history, growing, propagating, storing, pesto tips, and recipes all tied into basil, and that led to a great conversation about the different things that the listeners like to do with basil. And Sue Luftig said she couldn't imagine anyone who doesn't love basil, and she uses hers in simple pesto and also with vinegars as a summer salad dressing. So when I asked her for more information, here's what she wrote. In my food processor, I puree virgin olive oil, plenty of basil, young olives, and garlic. I don't use too much garlic. A tomato, salt, and pepper. And then I take it out and mix it with vinegar to taste. So that's her basil vinegar salad dressing. And then she wrote, as a different taste, substitute the tomato with strawberries. I thought that was a great idea. And another thing you could substitute for the tomato is watermelon. That would be a great substitute. And then Susan Vollenweider shared that she uses mint and basil in a water infuser, and it's so delicious. And then blogger Gail Eichelberger chimed in and said that she's planted African basil for the pollinators because it's so floriferous. And that's true. That's one of the things that I talked about in last week's episode, that when you let your basil bolt, when it goes to flower, it's attractive to all pollinators, bees and butterflies, as well as hummingbirds. Then lots of listeners shared what was going on in their garden. Kathleen Brown Bonafonte shared pictures from her latest plant shopping expedition, and she wrote, This is what happens when you and your growing friend visit a local nursery with a big plant sale. And then she showed all of these pictures of her trunk just completely loaded with plants. And then she wrote, He threw in a free goji berry bush for each of us and dug up some amazing mint in spearmint. Jen McGinnis of the blog Frau Zinni, and also featured as a guest in episode 534, shared what was blooming in her gorgeous Central Connecticut garden. And of course, as a blogger, Jen knows how to take some beautiful pictures of her garden. So that was great to see. Listener Elizabeth Kiefner shared her gorgeous lilacs in bloom, and they were full of beautiful butterflies and bumblebees just absolutely gorgeous. And what continues to amaze me is that Elizabeth's husband captured this incredible image of this butterfly on their lilacs with his iPhone 6S. And then he did a little bit of tweaking to enhance the colors. But I tell you, this picture is gallery quality. It was absolutely gorgeous. Listener Advisory Board member Patricia Chandler Newport shared this amazing image 
of this property that she's in charge of revitalizing. It's actually a 10-acre estate. And she showed this picture of this overgrown, weed-ridden property. And she wrote, just a tiny bit of weeding here. By the way, this 10-acre estate looks this way in every place the eye can see. Absolutely crazy. So she showed us some before and after pictures there. She's working really hard to make that place absolutely gorgeous. Listener Sue Luftig reached out to Bree Arthur, the author of the book, The Edible Landscape, and she said, I'm totally hooked on edible gardening, putting my lost space to work with corn, sunflowers, cucumber, and parsley. Of course, Bree was featured back in episode 569, and if you haven't listened to it yet, it's called The Foodscape Revolution, and it's all about using the amazing amounts of space we all have to plant more edibles in our garden. I especially loved Sue's picture of her garden because she had a picture of her German shepherd, Jerry, standing by the garden. Just fantastic. I love seeing our four-legged friends in the garden. I know for myself, Sunny is never far away whenever I'm gardening. And then listener Kirk Barley had a great idea for Sue. He said, you need some bright light Swiss chard and peas climbing your railing on your deck, which is right by her garden. I thought that was a great idea. Listener Danny Perkins shared a beautiful video of firefly activity in his garden. He's seen more firefly activity in his garden than ever before this particular year. And he shot this video with his iPhone. It's absolutely amazing. I didn't think we would see the fireflies because the video starts out pretty dark. He's filming his garden at night. And of course, those fireflies just show right up. And then Danny also shared images of his garden. He's having visitors this week. And so he did a quick walkthrough to make sure the garden was ready. And it was gorgeous. Absolutely spectacular. We had a number of posts this week requesting plant or pest IDs. Amber Gooden posted a beautiful picture of a yellow rose that had a spider on it. And then Beth Engel discovered that it was a flower crab spider and helped Amber identify that. That was great. Listener Sam Huff shared images of his mulberry tree. Yes, it is a mulberry tree. Danny Perkins was stumbled by some annuals that had gone to seed. He had some snapdragon as well as some annual baby's breath that had gone to seed. And that baby's breath is absolutely gorgeous. Kathleen Brown Bonafonte had images of Colorado potato beetles already on her tomato plants. And then she shared a great video of her five-year-old grandson following her around in the garden. That was just precious. Katrina Lucier shared pictures of bachelor buttons and then also a plant I was not familiar with. I had to look it up. It has the common name Spanish Bluebell. Very pretty. Patricia Chandler Newport did her good deed for the week. She took in a fig tree from a client that had been very neglected, and she's determined to rehabilitate it. And so we were giving her suggestions on what she could do to do that. And then as part of that, I found a very nice article on Gardenista that was called Seven Secrets, How to Save a Dying Fiddle Leaf Fig Tree. Had a lot of great tips in it. And then other curious listeners got into the spirit of sharing information. Beth Engel curated a great post all about this giant fluorescent pink slug that's found living on top of mountains in Australia. It's really disgusting looking, but it was fun to read about. Last week, I shared this post about using AstroTurf on your deck as a green carpet. And then listener Lisa Grams pointed out that it is very expensive and it can get very dangerously hot to the touch in the sun, depending on the AstroTurf that you're using. So those are two cautions you're going to want to keep in mind. And since I could not find affordable, small pieces of AstroTurf in my area, I went to Lowe's this week. And while I was there, I stumbled on this thing called an eco rug. It's an indoor outdoor rug. It's green like AstroTurf. It's six feet by eight feet, and it was only 20 bucks. So I think I'm going to be able to achieve the look that I was hoping for with the AstroTurf with this rug. And I'll post pictures in the group as soon as I get it put down this week. 
Anyway, I'm tickled to death. It was only 20 bucks. That was fantastic. When I was on Twitter this week, I found a very cute post from London Gardens. They shared this image of a fidget spinner. And if you have kids at home that are completely obsessed with fidget spinners, they'll get a kick out of this image as well. What they did is they took three tiny hens and chicks, little baby hens and chicks, and they put them on each one of the bearings, the three different bearings of the fidget spinner. Anyway, it was really, really cute. And they're using it as a way to promote gardening. And they say, give gardening a spin. Well, that's an update on the listener community. I just love the posts and the interactions of the community on Facebook. It's so great for me to be able to interact with you and then see posts from folks who share a passion for gardening and have a curiosity to learn more. So if you're interested, come hang out with us. Don't be shy. It's really so simple to be part of the group. I'd love for you to do it. Just the next time you're on Facebook, just go up to the search bar and type in still growing podcast group in the search bar and then request to join. I look forward to meeting you over in the group. Just a reminder, there is a phone number for the show. It's 865-333-GROW or 865-333-4769. There are two upcoming episodes I'd love to have your input on. The first is all about creating memorial gardens or memory gardens. So if you have created a memory garden in honor of a loved one who's passed away, please call that number and share the story of your memory garden garden, how you created it, and the things that are special about it. I would love to hear about your memory garden. And then the second show is all about favorite garden recipes. So if you have a favorite garden recipe that you get out this time of year to use with your garden harvest, please share that recipe with us. All you have to do is call the number 865-333-GROW or 865-333-4769. So just to recap, I'm looking for stories on memory gardens or your favorite garden recipes. All right, now it's time for the Garden News Roundup. This is a group of posts and articles that I have shared over the past week with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group, and it's made up of a dozen different segments, from updates on past guests to articles featuring fascinating folks in the world of horticulture that I'd love to chat with, and that's something that I call the Dream Guest Segment. I also cover news and information on special topic areas like sustainability and science. And then the other segments are really designed to honor the commitment of the show to helping you and your garden grow. And they are the how-to DIY segment, the continuing ed segment, the plant spotlight, segments devoted to shopping, recipes, inspiration, and quotables. Now, what's nice about this for you is that you can stay informed of the news in horticulture and gardening just by listening to this part of the show each week. And you can easily check out these curated articles and posts for yourself because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group, the Still Growing Podcast Group. So if you hear something and you want to read the full article, there's no need to take notes or track down links, just head over to the group and join and you'll see all of these articles. All right, let's go through them. In the guest update segment this week, past guest Jeff Gilman of episode 505, Decoding Gardening Advice, was interviewed by Margaret Roach in an article called Why It Can Be Dangerous to Use Vinegar to Kill Weeds. And the subtitle says, vinegar may sound like a good alternative to chemicals, but you should think twice before using it. In the article, Gilman says that there's potential for environmental damage, such as to the toad or salamander. He says, if you're talking about just sprouted seedlings, you go after them with household vinegar in a spray bottle, that's fine. Otherwise, you're going to want to hand cultivate. In fact, in the article, Margaret and Jeff both agree that their favorite way to take care of their garden is to use preventative mulches, well-timed cultivation, and hand weeding. They're indisputably effective and 100% environmentally safe. All right, also in the guest update segment this week, Sarah Griffin Bubakar of Peaceful Valley Grow Organic. She was featured back in episode 524. 
This is where we went through the Peaceful Valley Grow Organic Seed Catalog. And then also back in episode 514, where we talked about cover crops, shallots, and garlic. And all of those are available from Peaceful Valley Grow Organic. Anyway, there was a great article in the LA Times all about the Peaceful Valley Grow Organic founder, Bob Cantizano. It's a great article, it's a great read, and it's called How This Ninth Generation Californian Got His Start in Organic Farming. In sustainability, the blog Run Wild My Child shared a great article all about gardening with kids, how to make it more fun, and then a wildlife trust out of England shared a great post by Sue Bradley and how she makes insect hotels. This was very inspiring and also something you could do with kids this summer. There were four posts in Continuing Ed this week. Mother Earth News shared a great post all about grafting fruit trees. There's a lot of detail here about how to fuse stems with rootstocks to form fast-growing, fruit-bearing plants. Also in Continuing Ed is this resource from the University of Minnesota Extension. You head over to the link that's provided, and the top of it simply says, is this plant a weed? And then you choose the plant type, broadleaf, grass, sedge, woody, or moss. And then it will walk you through whether or not it's wanted or a weed. Green Bean Connection shared their June garden chores for abundance and super production. This was a great article, lots of detail here. And then the Washington Post shared a great article called Miss the Boat on Spring Gardening, Relax and Follow This Guide. This was a post by Barbara Damrosh, and I had a chuckle because she ended the article by saying, recently the French have deemed their common word for weed inappropriate, knowing that even weeds can have value. The current term for weed in French translates to bad plant. So some French are wanting to substitute the word adventus, a plant that simply takes advantage of a spot your garden offers. And then Barbara ends it by saying, sounds like a good name for the gardener as well. Listeners in the Facebook group replied, oh my gosh, now they won't call weeds weeds. How about plants that don't have a specific purpose or an uninvited guest? And then Elizabeth Kiefner chimed in, I consider any plant that I don't want growing in a specific place a weed, whether it's a good plant or not. All plants have their place in my opinion. I agree with Elizabeth. In the how-to DIY segment, Fresh Eggs Daily had their most recent post up, and it's all about controlling aphids naturally in the garden. This is such a common problem. It was great to see the number of solutions that they offered for fighting aphids in the garden. So if you have that problem, you're going to want to read through this article. It's everything from garlic juice spray to neem oil soil drench. There's a lot of different options. Also in the how-to DIY segment is a post from the spruce.com. It's called How to Use a Worm Tube in the Garden. Now, I had never heard of a worm tube, so let me quote directly what Colleen Vanderlinden said in this article. When I saw the worm tube composting method over at the National Gardening Association's website, I knew I had to try it. Basically, the idea is that you install a large six diameter tube or pipe directly into your garden bed and then drop your food scraps into it. Pests can't get into it, but the worms from the garden can. They will eat the goodies you leave, wiggle back out into your garden soil, and leave some goodies of their own in the form of vermicastings. Then the worms will spread the compost in a four-foot diameter as they travel throughout the garden underground. Using a worm tube also encourages more worms in the space, and then the article finishes up by sharing how you can create a worm tube. And there's a number of different ways you can do it. So that was a great how-to DIY this week. And then finally in the how-to DIY is an article by Lita Meredith in thespruce.com as well. And it's the best ways to store and preserve cilantro. 
Speaking of cilantro in the plant spotlight this week, there was a fun article that was shared on the Huffington Post, and it was called The Difference Between Cilantro and Coriander Explained. This is the part that I quoted for the Facebook group. It says, coriander is the term English speakers in the UK use to describe the herb. It comes from the French word for this herb, coriander. In the United States, however, fresh coriander is referred to as cilantro. Folks have speculated that this is because the herb was made popular in the States through Mexican cuisine, which is naturally called by its Spanish name. What we know for sure is that cilantro and coriander are two names for the same herb, and both are correct. In the listener community, lots of listeners chimed in and said, hey, I didn't know this. This is great. Sherry Kump chimed in. That explains why my daughter in Australia was confused. So yes, one plant, so much confusion. In the news this week are some gorgeous blue poppies that are growing in Scotland. And apparently, it was a hot trend in Scotland among the nurseries and designers. This spectacular blue flowering plant is from the Himalayas. It likes cool, damp summers and relatively mild winters. And so Scotland is the perfect place to grow this beautiful blue flower. And when I wrote about it, I said, you guys need to be sitting down because this one is absolutely gorgeous. And folks loved this post. There were a couple of different articles that I read about this record horticulture harvest in India. The Agriculture Ministry released numbers this spring that said the production of horticultural crops like fruits and vegetables touched a record high of 295 million tons. India's horticulture production has grown at a phenomenal pace. And just to give you an idea, Indian farmers now produce more than double the quantity of fruits and vegetables compared to what they did in early 2000. Tremendous growth there. Then here's a contest you guys can join. The amazing ladies behind Potted, LA's mecca for design-loving gardening enthusiasts, are celebrating the publication of their book, Potted, Make Your Own Stylish Gardening Containers. They're having a DIY planter contest, totally fitting. The winner will receive a $500 gift card to the store, or you can shop online, plus you get a copy of the book. So I will put a link to their contest on their website. It's called the Potted Style DIY Planter Contest. The winner gets the $500 gift certificate and the top five folks will receive a copy of the book. So what they want you to do is to take a picture of your own DIY container And then share it on Instagram. So this, they say, will not be a popularity contest. Each photo will be judged via Instagram on its merits for creativity and execution. And the hashtag that you'll want to use is potted style DIY. And then follow at potted store on Instagram. I'll put the details in the Facebook group. And then finally, I shared an audio interview with a New York radio station that featured Rick Dark and Andy Pettis. Rick is the author of his brand new book about the gardens of the High Line in New York. Subtitle is Elevating the Nature of Modern Landscapes. This was a 15 minute interview. It was very well done. Very interesting to hear about how they transformed the High Line and created the gardens that are just absolutely fabulous to visit in New York. In the Dream Guest segment, there are two folks. The first is the gangsta gardener who is changing South Central LA with soil. This is all about Ron Finley. It's an article that appeared in Vogue. He's an LA-based activist and guerrilla gardener. He says to change a community, you have to change the soil. And he's been doing that since 2010 when he planted a produce garden on the empty strip of land between his house and the road. He would be a great dream guest. And then I stumbled on a fantastic video by NationalGeographic.com. It was featuring Sam Van Aken, and he grafted this tree, this crazy tree that grows 40 kinds of fruit. This was a video that was created back in 2015, but I thought it was extra special, and I'd love to talk to Sam about grafting this tree with 40 different kinds of fruit. Absolutely amazing. 
In science this week, there were a number of great articles. The first is from Science Alert, and it was called Fungus from a Toxic Mine Pit Have Teamed Up to Produce a New Type of Antibiotic. This was published early in May, and they use two species of fungus from this toxic mine pit in Montana, and then they create this compound that resembles a known class of antibiotic except for one major detail. The way it kills bacteria is unlike anything scientists have ever seen before, and it's already proven effective against the bugs that cause anthrax and strep throat. That was interesting. Then newatlas.com shared an article that says plant brains use human-like process to decide when to sprout. A team from the University of Birmingham discovered a cluster of cells in seeds that act like a brain to decide when the plant should sprout. That finding could help improve crop yields. Another fascinating article that was shared by Science Alert is that Scientists just solved the strange case of pine trees that always lean toward the equator. Now, what was neat about this story is that it started out the way many scientific processes start out, and that's with an observation. So there was a botanist named Matt Ritter from Cal Poly in California, and he noticed that in California and Hawaii, the pines all seem to lean south. And weirdly enough, colleagues told him that in the southern hemisphere, the trees leaned north. So to investigate this, Matt and his team gathered measurements from 256 trees across 18 regions on five continents. They recorded the height of each tree, the trunk diameter, and to their surprise they found a consistent pattern of hemisphere-dependent directional leaning in this one type of pine, the A. columnaris. Very interesting article. Now, just to be clear, they're really only talking about this one variety of pine tree that they refer to as the cook pine. It's known as the A. columnaris that's commonly grown in Australia, but obviously is grown in other parts of the world as well. And this particular study was originally published in Ecology, but it's very interesting, isn't it? There was a fascinating article in Wired.com that was called Want to Save the Trees? Unleash the Fungus. And here's how it starts out. They call it shroom juice, a dark slurry of fungi that will not get you high. Workers dump packages of magic powder into buckets, add water, and stir. Then they grab saplings, dunk the roots into the mix, and drop the baby trees in the ground. And the whole reason they're doing this is because researchers have found in Appalachia that without inoculating the trees with the fungus— these little trees go into transplant shock. So by inoculating them, they can avoid the shock phase altogether. And then finally, there was another article about how our forests are changing. This one was called Western Forests Might One Day Look More Like Eastern Forests. Very interesting, great article. It's another one in a series of articles that I've been posting about the way our forests have been changing. In shopping this week, thekitchen.com shared a great post called, Do You Really Need a Strawberry Huller? And I have this tool and it came in handy today when Emma made a strawberry oatmeal crumble. It was fantastic. And of course, we got out our trusty strawberry huller and we love it. So this article was all about that and that made the shopping segment this week. There was one summer, probably about five summers back, where I went to a kitchen gadget store, and I think I bought three or four of these, and I gave them away for Mother's Day or birthday presents. Absolutely loved this gift, and I think it was under 7 bucks, something like that. Now, also in shopping this week is that new book called Gardens of the High Line. It's 25 bucks on Amazon, and it's fantastic. It gives a great overview of the history of the High Line, what it took to create this magnificent masterpiece right in the heart of New York City. It was quite an endeavor. I want to read to you this little excerpt to give you a flavor of what these guys were up against when they were trying to create the High Line back in the late 90s. 
The High Line's existence is a testament to what two determined ordinary citizens with a brilliant idea can accomplish. Robert Hammond, an artist and consultant to internet startups, and Joshua David, a travel writer, became its unlikely founders after they met at a community board meeting in 1999. City officials were planning to tear down the mile-and-a-half abandoned railway structure, and for a while it seemed that Hammond and David were the only people in the city opposed to that demolition. But they not only saved the iconic 1930s steel framework, but also shepherded its transformation into a revolutionary new kind of botanic garden. The pictures look amazing. So that made the shopping segment this week. 25 bucks would make a great Father's Day gift as well. And then if you have money to burn... I found these gorgeous recycled metal ostrich planters. They're very expensive. The small one is $265. The large one is $365. But they're tremendous. People were commenting. They're gorgeous. An inspiration this week, Garden Betty shared a tour of P. Allen Smith's Moss Mountain Farm. That was fantastic. There was a great article shared in philly.com called How the Farmer's Market Feeds My Soul. That was perfect for the inspiration segment this week. In the New York Times, there was a letter of recommendation shared, and it was all about pothos, the houseplant. Pictorial shared magnificent turn-of-the-century seed art catalogs, so that post was shared And then finally, Lisa Steele of the blog Harmony in the Garden shared a post called New Adventures, New Gardens, and New Memories. And I just wanted to read the first little bit of this post because I thought it was absolutely extraordinary. She wrote, Last year, Alan Bush, a Garden Rant contributor, wrote an article about growing weary in the garden, one which resonated deep within my heart. And then here she's quoting what Alan wrote. I thought of an interview with the writer Reynolds Price. Price was asked what his greatest gift as a child had been. He said his favorite gift had come from his grandmother. She had told him a story. Reynolds Price's grandmother compared life to a traffic light. She explained that the light stays green for a long time, but eventually it turns yellow and you have to slow down. And then the light turns red and you have to stop and wait. Be patient, and the light will sooner or later turn green again. I'm not going to tell you what the rest of this post is about, but I fell in love with Lisa's writing, and I explored her blog a little bit more, and I'm a huge fan now. So I hope you take time to check out her blog, Harmony in the Garden, all one word, harmonyinthegarden.com. And then, oh my goodness, there were a lot of recipes that got shared in the group this week. The first thing is an all the green things salad. The salad's chock full of lovely green produce ranging from crunchy to creamy. It's fantastic. This was from cookinglight.com. There was a creamed peas with eggs recipe that was shared from the spruce.com. There was a dilled red potatoes and peas recipe. There are a lot of peas recipes here by fruitycrush.com. And then Milk Street, Christopher Kimball's Milk Street. I'm a huge fan of this new catalog. They shared on their Facebook page this amazing video of Israeli hummus. It's warm, whipped, and drizzled. And they traveled to Israel in pursuit of the perfect hummus. And you get the recipe for free this week. It's awesome. And then the Kitchen Window, a local kitchen store here in Minneapolis, they they do cooking classes and things like that. They shared a great tip. They said, when a recipe calls for softened butter, but yours is rock hard cold, use a coarse grater and grate what you need. Spread out the shreds and it will soften quickly and be ready to use in just a minute or two. I thought that was a great idea. And then the inspiration for the quote this week came from a post about the Chelsea Flower Show, and it was the Poetry Lover's Garden. This garden was designed by Fiona Cadwallader, and the inspiration for her garden was by Samuel Taylor Coolidge, and it's his poem called, The Lime Tree Bower is My Prison. So I did a little research on the poem. It was written during 1797. And the poem discusses a time in which Coolidge was forced to stay beneath a lime tree while his friends were able to enjoy the countryside. So you can listen to how the poem begins by explaining how the narrator was separated from his friends. 
Well, they are gone, and here I must remain, this lime tree bower my prison. I have lost beauties and feelings, such as the world would have been most sweet to my remembrance, even when age had dimmed mine eyes to blindness. They, meanwhile, friends, whom I never more may meet again, on springy heath along the hilltop edge, wander in gladness and wind down perchance to that still roaring dell of which I told. Anyway, the poem goes on for quite a while more, and it describes the journey that his friends took as they're exploring, and then it talks a little bit about his friend, Charles Lamb. But most importantly, this beautifully stunning garden that was featured in the Chelsea Garden Show was totally inspired by this particular poem. So read the poem, look at the images of the garden. You won't regret your time spent doing that. Well, that's it for the Garden News Roundup for this week's show. Just a reminder that you can get all of the posts that I mentioned in the Roundup with links and bonus content in your Facebook feed if you join the listener community in the free Facebook group. Just look for the Still Growing Podcast group and then request to join the next time you're in Facebook. I'd love to meet you in the group. All right, now on to the topic of today's show, how to make your new garden feel older. We often feel romantic or nostalgic when we think of old or well-established gardens. The idealized older garden is often envisioned as a lush landscape with paths, coordinated structures, and large trees enveloping a charming home. But is there a way to achieve an established look without having to wait 20, 30, 40, or more years? I mentioned earlier in the introduction that I believe I can relate to most gardeners when I say that I'm impatient when it comes to design. I know that's not unique to me. So today's show is my way of sharing some of the best choices I've made in my own garden to give me the look that I longed for when I first started gardening. There are some things you can do right now to set your garden up for success, to create a garden that feels welcoming and comfortable, lush and natural, and yes, established. So for this show on how to make your new garden feel older, let me give you a quick roadmap. I'll start with a brief overview of the benefits of touring established gardens. It's an absolute must do for you if you're designing your garden by yourself. Then I'll take you through some of the best plant selections you can make right now to create that established garden feeling more quickly. From an aesthetic standpoint, I'll share my thoughts on elements like paths, containers, furniture, outdoor structures, and collections that can add an evolved sense to your garden. And then I'll wrap up with my favorite part of aging the garden gracefully. I'm going to tell you about various creative techniques you can use to get crafty this year, to age your terracotta pots, to give your metal, ironwork, wood items, and statues that weathered, distinguished look. I think you'll find these DIYs to be particularly inspiring. So let's get started. Okay, the first point is that you need to start with a plan. And as you're creating your plan, I want you to keep in mind that you are attempting to incorporate history into your garden with a plan that looks as if it's been added onto over time. So throughout the garden, as you're working on your plan, choose inconsistent styles and varying accents along a theme to create kind of a haphazard effect. And when you're doing this, you're furthering the idea that the plan was not completed all at once. So I'll give you a story. I have a neighbor across the street that used to work at Chico's. And one time I was in there and I was buying something for my mom. I love to buy jewelry. And I was buying her a necklace. And then I saw the matching earrings. And then I saw the bracelet. And it was all on clearance. And I wanted to get it for my mom. And then my neighbor said, you know, I think it looks more sophisticated when everything isn't so matchy-matchy. And then she talked to me about how she was moving away from that and how if we incorporated some other complementary pieces, it would just elevate the level of sophistication. So I think the same is true when it comes to your garden. 
if you create your garden all at once and everything matches and everything's consistent and you have the same everything, the same wall, the same mulch, the same pathway, the same steppers, and it's just set on repeat all the way through your garden, it's very obvious that it's a new garden. Evolved gardens are like homes that you add on to. You add on and you create a mudroom or you add on and you create a deck. And it's never going to match perfectly with the existing structure. Of course, you try to coordinate it, but that's how you get that evolved look over time. And the same is true in your garden. So in the garden, you'll see things like we add fire pits or water features or pergolas, these structures that can represent renovations that gradually evolve over time. And then when someone enters your garden, they'll say, wow, this garden's been here forever because they see all of these different components. They're not totally matchy-matchy. And when someone asks you, how old is this garden? You know you've hit the mark. So under normal circumstances, the way gardens evolve is that the gardener is always pushing to add one more thing to the garden. We can all relate to that. At any given time, we might want to add a patio, a kitchen garden, an orchard, a hammock, a shade garden, a sandbox, what have you. And each of these pieces, as they get added, help to age the garden. So keep that inconsistent style, that haphazard effect in mind as you're planning your garden. The other overarching concept that I'd like you to keep in mind is to anchor your garden. Established gardens feel so connected to the ground. They feel so connected and anchored to the spot where they are. And whenever I think about anchoring the garden, I usually think of the bones of the garden. In garden design, the bones refers to something usually architectural or something heavy, something solid like stone. It can be artificial like an arbor or an obelisk, or it can even be a plant like an evergreen tree or a shrub. But the anchors in your design are your investment pieces they are the things that kind of stand the test of time in your garden. And they are an important part, probably the most important part of putting together a plan to make a new garden look older. Finally, along with starting with a plan, incorporate some tours so that you can get ideas. One of the best ways to get ideas about older gardens is to go tour them, walk around them. See if you can't detect ways to get the established look achieved almost immediately in your garden. And one of the best ways to get that instant garden that you're craving is to have a vision for it. So if you're unclear about what you need to do in a space or an area of your garden, see if you can't stand on the shoulders of giants, stand on the shoulders of people who have already designed successful old gardens and then iterate off of their work. All right, we started out by saying that we were going to begin with a plan, and the two principles that I wanted you to keep in mind as we're building our plan, as we're creating our plan, is that one, we want to go for an inconsistent style to give that sense that the garden has evolved over time, that it's settling in at varying rates as you go through the garden, just like it would over time, naturally, we're going to incorporate that artificially. We're going to make that happen as we're making choices and selections in our garden. And then second of all, to remember that at every turn, whether we're picking plants or we're picking stones or architectural items, our goal is to really focus on anchoring the garden first. Adorable little plants like the pincushion flower or picking your annuals for your containers this year are lovely things to do. They're wonderful. They're great, but they don't anchor the garden in the same way as some of these more substantial items do. So we're going to focus our attention on anchoring the garden every chance we get as we work on our plan. So we've toured some other gardens, some established gardens to get ideas to see what we like, what works, and we're going to take pictures of that and we're going to incorporate that. We're going to be looking for the bigger plants, the architectural items, 
the flow in that garden, looking for that inconsistent haphazard effect that evolves naturally over time. And now we're going to start putting in the components of our plan. So let's begin by talking about trees, evergreens, and shrubs. You know, there's that old Chinese proverb that says, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. And when we're thinking about anchoring our garden and putting trees and evergreens and larger shrubs into the landscape, there's no better time than at the very beginning phase of planting your garden. And as proof of that, you know, a few weeks ago, back in episode 571, I did this episode where I researched the 40 most wanted plants. These were the plants that people were talking about on social media. They were finishing the sentence, I wish I planted more of, and then fill in the blank. And do you know the number one comment was trees? People wish that they could go back in time and plant more trees. So that proverb, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, the second best time is now, there is so much wisdom in those lines. And another example from pop culture would be a scene in The Lion King. Simba's kind of moping around. He's regretting the past. And to snap him out of it, Rafiki hits him over the head with a stick. And Simba says, geez, what was that for? And Rafiki replies, it doesn't matter. It's in the past. And Simba says, yeah, but it still hurts. And Rafiki says, Oh, yes, the past can hurt, but from the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. So learn from people who have established gardens, and I bet if you talk to them, one of the things they'll tell you is that they took care of their tree decisions right away. They didn't wait. They knew that even though it maybe wasn't the most exciting or life-giving choice they could have made at the time, they took care of those big, important anchors, their trees on their property. And they know intrinsically what many people often regret later on, that the trees really give the garden a feeling that it's been there for a while. And just as important, sometimes when you're new to your garden, if you're new to your garden space, it's just as important to look over the property and determine what old things you can keep. So if there are already established trees on the property, sometimes you can get a jump start on having those older specimens help anchor your property. You know, the bones of the garden, the trees that are in your garden are what make it really pretty in the off season, in winter, in fall, when things are starting to die back, when the perennials and the annuals are not giving you that color. And oftentimes, even if you're walking into a garden that you're just starting to get to know, you'll start to see that the trees on the property are oftentimes pushed to the boundaries and the borders of your garden. They definitely help define your space. So if you have the opportunity to incorporate a fabulous grand old tree into your design, into the bones of the garden as you're starting to create that, by all means, take advantage of it. Another thing to consider when you're planting trees is that you can plant many groves. So instead of planting one red bud, or one service berry, or one dogwood. Try planting groups of three placed in key beds around your property. And don't forget one other magnificent benefit of having trees in your garden, and that is that they have a calming and healing influence over the feeling of your property. Trees help give you that settled-in feeling And that calm is a good thing because it will impact you as the gardener as well. And the more calm and relaxed and healing you can feel when you're in the garden, the better. Now, I don't want you to stress out if you're looking at your garden and you're thinking, 
oh my gosh, I've done it completely wrong. I didn't add any trees or I'm way behind on the tree thing. We have all done something like that. We all do things like that. And don't forget what the proverb tells you. It says the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, but the second best time is right now. So this year, divert some of the money that you had going to annuals and perennials if you still have any left in your budget and look at ways you can incorporate trees into your landscape. Because even if you have an established garden with relatively few trees, you can still help that garden along with just a few changes here and there. And adding trees is something I really don't think you'll regret. Don't forget it was the most wished for item when people were talking about their gardens on social media. I wish I planted more trees. It wasn't zinnia. It wasn't allium, even though I love those plants. Trees was the number one thing, even on Twitter. Now, of course, once your trees are in, your shrubs and your evergreens, I'll talk a little bit more about those items in a minute, then you can always surround these larger anchor pieces with supporting cast plants. So the next time you're out plant shopping, ask yourself if what you're putting in your cart is going to be an anchor in your garden, or if it's just another beautiful supporting cast member. Because I'm here to tell you that an entire cart of three to 20 inch tall perennials is not going to anchor your garden, not in the same way that trees, shrubs, or evergreens can. Those mature trees and shrubs that you invest in today will make the backdrop of your home feel warm and comfortable. And one of the key ways to identify where to site your large trees and shrubs is to go inside the house and start looking outside at your property through your windows. Because your windows are framing your property in a way that you can't do when you're just standing outside and looking around. So go in your house and identify three to five key places where large trees and shrubs would make an impact, where they would have a wow factor on your property. Now, of course, if you're starting from scratch, you get to do this right out of the gate. You get to do this first. Plant your trees and shrubs so that they can anchor the flower beds and start growing. But if you already have your flower beds established, Go in the house, look through the window, and see if there isn't a way to incorporate trees into those beds now after the fact. It might involve a little transplanting. But remember, the second best time is now. So let's make that happen. Now, I want to make sure that I spend just a moment here commenting on fitting evergreens into your plan. You know, established gardens often successfully incorporate things like evergreens into their mixed borders. And there's a fair amount of home gardeners who have an enthusiasm for wanting evergreens on their property. But if you haven't considered it, you definitely should because evergreens make wonderful garden bones because they have so many different varieties to offer from the dwarf evergreens that are currently on the market to the larger old standards. If you have an immense property and you need to really anchor that huge property down. But let's talk a little bit about dwarf conifers and using them as anchors or as garden bones for your garden. You know, that term gets thrown around quite a bit, dwarf conifers and shrubs. And I wish when people mentioned the word dwarf conifer that they qualified it with exactly what they're talking about. Because in general, dwarf conifers are evergreen trees and shrubs that when they're mature will have a height of fewer than 12 feet. So these are not going to be 30, 40, 50 feet in the air and taking up a 20, 30 foot circumference in your garden. These are smaller evergreen trees and shrubs. And for the most part, keep in mind that dwarf conifers, these evergreen trees and shrubs that have a mature height of fewer than 12 feet are slow growing. 
So even if you do a lousy job of citing this evergreen, your dwarf conifer, let's say at some point in the future you realize that it's not in the right spot or you need to redo the garden, you either need to take that tree out or try to transplant it if you can. It's not the end of the world. They're so slow growing that you'll have plenty of time to figure out what you're going to do with regard to the position of that dwarf conifer. Maybe you'll leave it be and you'll work around it. Maybe it needs to go. But the point is that you can definitely go ahead and plant these dwarf conifers in your landscape to get the green and the structure, the year-round beauty of these trees in your landscape. And if you hit the jackpot and they're perfectly sited and you're thrilled with where they're located, you'll be able to enjoy them for decades. Now, I'm just going to take a quick second here to walk you through a few of my favorite dwarf conifers and shrubs. The first one is a small shrub called Hudsonia. So it's the word Hudson with an I-A after it. This is a small, slow-growing balsam fir that's really great in smaller yards and landscapes. It's in the balsam family, so it's very aromatic. Now, this one is on the small side. It's only going to be about two feet around within the first 10 years of growing it. So you've got plenty of time to figure out what you're going to do around that space after you place this particular evergreen shrub. Now, the Hudsonia can be grown in zones three through seven. So there's a lot of versatility there for northern gardeners. Now, another one that I like is a golden dwarf variety that's known as Minima aria. This is a more upright shrub. It's a beautiful, bright yellow false cypress, and it looks like a little pyramid shape. So it gives you a little bit of height, and it's easy growing. Now, you'll want to put this one in a protected area of your garden. It does not want to be blown away by winds. So if you're going to just stand it out in the middle of nowhere on your property, it's not going to like that. Either protect it with other things that are around it, put it near a fence, put it near other trees and shrubs that'll give it some protection, but it will be fine in zones four through eight. Now here's one that gets to about three feet high. It's the common juniper. It's known as compressa, and compressa is a dense columnar dwarf tree. And what I love about it is it adds that little touch of formality when you're planning your garden. And it's absolutely lovely that it stops at about three feet high. So instead of being this overwhelming arborvitae that can just go bananas after the first five years, this guy is going to stay short, thus the term compressa. And even better, it's super hardy in northern gardens. So the hardiness zone for this is two to seven. Another one of my favorites is the Dwarf Alberta Spruce. This is the Konica. It is very popular. It gets about four feet high and two feet wide. It has that conical shape, thus the term Konica. And new growth in the spring is like a bright lime green. So it's a very vivid, striking shrub. And Harvard University published this nice little article about the dwarf Alberta spruce, the conica. And I wanted to read it to you. It's by John Hetman, the communications and stewardship officer at the Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University. And I just thought it was an interesting story about the history of the dwarf Alberta spruce, the conica. Here we go. The discovery and introduction of the conica offers a remarkable example of horticultural discovery as happenstance. In 1904, staff members took a stroll while waiting at a train station near Lake Ligon, Alberta, and they noticed some unusual dwarf spruces growing nearby. They speculated that a spruce with a witch's broom had dropped seeds and produced small, compact plants with tight foliage. As agents for the Arboretum, they couldn't resist collecting their extraordinary find for further study. And so the plant made the cross-continental journey to the Arboretum with them. And they're referring to this Arnold Arboretum of Harvard University. Thus begins the horticultural tale of one of the most familiar and conspicuous plants in cultivation, the dwarf 
slow growing evergreen known popularly as the dwarf Alberta spruce. Now, it goes on to say that as a specimen plant, dwarf Alberta spruces have few disadvantages, rarely producing cones and amenable to creating topiary forms when grown in containers. So that was kind of a sweet little history there of the dwarf Alberta spruce. Next up on my list would be the mugo pine that's known as gnome, G-N-O-M. It's also known as creeping pine or dwarf mountain pine or mugo pine. Lots of names for this one. This one's more compact. It's about two feet high, four feet wide. So it's a little butterball. It's hardy in zones three through seven. And this little gnome mugo pine will form low mounding, almost bonsai-like structures in the garden. It will grow really almost anywhere with any type of soil. All right, last on my list for you to look up is the pendula. This is also known as the eastern hemlock or the eastern hemlock spruce or the Canadian hemlock. Its official name is the Suga canadensis pendula, and the canadensis means it's hardy from Canada, and the pendula means it's a weeper. So it's one of those evergreens that just grows up and then starts to weep down to the ground. These look fantastic if they're draping over a wall. I love to give them lots of room and just let them amble about. You can grow it in zones three through seven. It can be three feet high and eight feet wide. So you want to give this one plenty of birth. And here's something else to think about with this pendula. It can tolerate a considerable amount of shade. So don't be afraid to incorporate these dwarf conifers into shady parts of your yard or garden. All right, now I wanted to offer up some fast-growing shrub selections so that you can have that instant garden impact that you're looking for. So we've already talked about some of those dwarf conifer shrubs that can give your garden an older look, whether you're talking about yews that are shaped into a formal hedge or a boxwood, what have you, or the other varieties that I talked about. Now, one of my absolute favorite shrubs to give you that substantial shrub mass with a gorgeous flower is the old-fashioned Annabelle hydrangea. Another fast-growing, very common shrub to consider is the dogwood. It's so versatile in the garden. It's pretty much happy wherever you plant it. And you end up getting these stems that are either red or yellow or orange. And you can do so much with those to decorate in the off season in the fall. So dogwoods are great. Now, if you're in a warmer climate, like zones six through nine, you can incorporate a wonderful shrub known as the cherry laurel. And there are a lot of different varieties. The skip cherry laurel, the English cherry laurel. There's a purple leaf sand cherry that you can grow in zones two through eight. So that would be a northern variety that you could consider in a colder climate. But whenever you think of like the ancient Romans or the poet laureate, and they have that wreath that's on their head, those were made with laurel branches. And it refers to any tree with slightly leathery evergreen leaves. So there are a lot of shrubs and trees that are called a laurel of one kind or another. Now, if you're looking for privacy or you're looking to create some type of hedge, a privet is a flowering plant. There are about 50 different species. They're upright, deciduous, or evergreen shrubs. They can give you that formal structure and border to your garden, and they grow amazingly fast. Another great option to add early on is the common elder. So the fruit is the elderberry, and it grows very high, so it's wonderful to add either as a hedge or as a just a freestanding plant in the garden to give you some height, to give you that anchor that you're looking for. And then we already talked about hydrangea, but I do love hydrangea just because of their large flowers, 
their large mass that not only takes up a lot of great space and heft in the garden, but I love that they die back so that when the season is over and you need to get into that bed in the winter, they are going to die completely to the ground. And sometimes that's just the ticket in the off season if you have a space that you need to get into. All right, so now we've talked about the different types of trees, evergreens, and shrubs we'll be considering. Now let's move on to some perennials, to some plant selections. Now, when we're thinking about plant selections, we're looking for two things, two types of perennials that are going to help anchor that garden down along with the trees, evergreens, and shrubs. And those are tall perennials and perennials with big leaves. Now, you can listen to the selections that I'm going to share with you now, or the next time you're walking into a nursery or a garden center or a greenhouse, just ask them to show you the taller perennials or the perennials with the biggest leaves that they have, and then make selections based on those options that you have available locally for you. So keep in mind that one of the things that we all enjoy when we go into that older established garden is that the plants have had time to reach their mature size and they spread out and they're taller. And that height kind of performs a type of visual trick where when people are looking at those plants, they just assume that they're older, that they're more mature, that they're more developed because they are taller. And I always tell my kids, most of them are six feet or over six feet. I'll say, don't forget that when people look at you, they don't know that you're 13 or 15 years old. They probably think you're four to five years older than that because you're so tall. My daughter will come home from working at the grocery store where she's a beggar, and she'll say, Mom, people came up to me today and were asking me questions because they assume I'm the manager. And I think that is a direct result of the fact that she's almost six feet tall. She doesn't look like her peers that are working in the store that are much shorter. So let me walk you through some tall plants, some perennials, some annuals that you can incorporate into your garden that are going to give you that height, that look of these super established anchored plants in the garden that'll convey that settling, that grounding, that anchoring that we're looking for. First of all, let's talk about zinnia. Did you know that there are four foot zinnias available that you can grow They're so easy to grow from seed. They're colorful. They bloom all the way through frost. And the taller varieties include California Giant, Big Red, State Fair, and My Lucky Ladies. So if you're a Zinnia fan, let's take it up a notch. Let's go a little bit taller in your newer garden to give it that older feel and go with bigger, taller Zinnias. Another tall perennial that's all over my garden is Joe Pie Weed. This is the big Joe Pie Weed, not the gateway, not the shorter Joe Pie Weed. Now, here's what's great about Joe Pie Weed. You get this huge plant with the purple stems and then these beautiful plumes of purple flowers. It's spectacular. It will seed itself in your garden. And that can be a good thing if you have a new garden and you want flowers that are going to seed themselves. That's a great way to propagate throughout your garden. Sometimes Joe Pie wants to make a home in a spot where it just doesn't look great, like right out in front in the middle of a very low bed or just in an inconvenient place, like right in front of where you need to get your garden hose. I've just shared with you two things that I'm dealing with right now. But let me tell you something. When I have friends that complain about Joe Pie Weed, I just kind of laugh and brush it off because you know what? It is so easy to pull out of the ground. It is not a big deal if Joe Pie Weed seeds itself into a part of your garden that you don't want it to be. You just pull it out. It's not that hard. But talk about height. It's one of the tallest flowers in the garden and the pollinators go crazy for it. It's just a joy to have Joe Pie Weed in your garden. Now, another tall perennial that you can incorporate into your garden is delphinium. Beautiful blue flowers. It's a summer garden staple. I always plant it under my flag. And by the 4th of July, I have my red lilies and my blue delphinium and then all kinds of white flowers kind of scattered throughout. And that's my red, white, and blue garden. And it's always popping off right before the 4th of July. I love it. 
delphiniums can grow to be about six feet tall. I've never had one grow that tall. I think the tallest delphinium I've ever been able to grow was about five feet tall. Most of mine are right between three and four feet tall, but they've got that blue flower. People love blue flowers and they can handle full sun or they can handle partial shade. They're great. Sunflower and hollyhocks would be other wonderful tall flowers that you can plant in the garden. Cleome, the spider flower, is another option. They can grow up to be six feet tall. I've never seen one that tall, but they're definitely taller flowers in the garden. I tell you what, cannas make for a very bold, tall statement in the garden. They kind of meet the criteria of both being tall and big leaves. I mean, they really can anchor a garden. I was just at a garden tour last summer, and we walked into the backyard, and this woman had a half circle that was solid cannas. I, I think it was like 20 feet by oh, I don't know, eight feet, 10 feet, and it was loaded with cannas. And it was so impressive. It was the backdrop to a pond that she had. And you want to talk about anchoring the garden, anchoring that middle lawn section of the garden with this huge swath of cannas. It was amazing. And there is a canna that's known as the musafolia, and that can get up to 12 feet tall in a season. So if it's happy, and if it's got wet feet, if it's warm, that thing is going to grow amazingly tall. Now, don't forget with cannas, you've got to do that last step. You've got to go out to the garden right before it freezes, and you've got to dig up those rhizomes. You've got to dig them up. You've got to store them in a cool place. And then you've got to get out in the spring and plant them again. That's probably the biggest drawback to dealing with something like a canna because you can get kind of fatigued toward the end of the season and just say, forget it. But they're so worth it. Now, here's a great native plant to consider. It's Boltonia. So this is also known as the white doll's daisy, false aster, or false chamomile. It is a native plant to the United States and Canada. It looks an awful lot like an aster. It's got white or pink flowers, and it can grow up to six feet tall. It puts on a huge show of blooms in the late summer or fall, just like other asters do. And I read an article where someone said, it's like an aster on steroids. So it's going to want full sun. But Boltonia would be another tall, wonderful specimen to incorporate into your garden. Now, another thing that you could put in the garden that's got a beautiful bloom on it is this very tall rutabecchia that's known as Autumn Sun. Autumn Sun is the translation of its name, Herbst Sonne. But if you're looking for golden blooms in the late summertime, just think of this tall, late flowering cone flower. It can grow four to seven feet tall, depending on where it's located, and it can spread three to five feet. So this one makes excellent cut flowers. It's wonderful. It's gotten all kinds of awards. It's easy to grow, trouble-free. Look for autumn sun, Rudbeckia. Now, there are a couple of taller plants that are in my garden that definitely help anchor it that I don't see on many taller plant lists, but I wanted to share them with you today. The first is Angelica. It's a tall biennial and perennial herb. And this thing is amazing in the garden. You're not going to be able to control really where it wants to go. I think of it as a little bit like the Egyptian walking onion. It's going to show up wherever. Hey, the Egyptian walking onion would be another great taller specimen that really can expand in the garden and just look very impressive and very architectural. So keep that one in mind. But this Angelica, I like. I do kind of pay attention to where it's popping up. If I don't like it, I'll just pull it out. But generally speaking, it does a great job of seeding itself in my garden. And I'm very happy for the most part with where it pops up. And the bloom is so amazing, so striking that it's a definite keeper for me. It's just one of the most impressive, taller plants that I have in the garden. I probably like it a little bit better than Joe Pieweed. It's got that purple bloom, but it's just a personal preference. I love Joe Pieweed as well. And then another super tall plant that I have in my garden is Lovage. Lovage is a tall perennial. It's in the salary family. 
Mind Lovage is definitely over six feet tall. It does start to seed in other areas of the garden. So if you don't want it in a spot, you're going to have to pull it out. Not a big deal to do that. It does flower and it creates these little umbels because, of course, it's in the celery family. And the flowers are yellow to greenish yellow. You, we really wouldn't be growing it, though, for the flowers. You would be growing it for the beautiful green foliage and the fact that it's so tall to give you that height and anchor in the garden. Oops, I just remembered one more from my garden that I wanted to tell you about, and that's the cup plant. This is a super tall perennial. It's got happy yellow flowers at the top. It looks like a dandelion on steroids. I'll, I'll tell you, that's what it looks like. It's got these daisy, beautiful flowers that pop up in the summertime. It's absolutely gorgeous. They will kind of make a little grove for themselves as they're growing. And then I love the way that the leaves come together on the stem. They actually form a little cup around the stem and then water will collect in there and the birds go crazy for that because it's a great way for them to get water during the summer. They'll go up to those leaves. You'll see finches and all kinds of birds just taking a little drink out of the leaves where the stem and the leaves connect because it makes that little cup. But the beautiful yellow flowers start appearing in the midsummer. It goes all the way till fall. They look kind of like sunflowers, but the heads are a little bit smaller. Anyway, that would be a wonderful tall flower to add. Okay, let's move on to the plants that have big leaves. You know, plants that have big leaves will look a lot less like they were just planted and they will get to mature size sooner. So looking for those big leafed plants really pays off. Ligularia would be an option here. The rocket, I have that growing in my garden that likes wet feet. Rogersia or Rogers plant. I love that plant. I just bought that a couple of years ago. I have that growing in an area that has a lot of moisture. So that likes wet feet. It's got such a crazy colored foliage. It's kind of a brown. It's amazing. I love that plant. Bigger leaf. You know, rhubarb or Indian rhubarb would be big leafed plants that you could grow. Brussels sprouts would be in that category as well. Very impressive. That Indian rhubarb is also known as umbrella plant. I love that plant. That actually is on the cover of the album cover for the Still Growing podcast. So if you ever look at the album cover and you see that little pink flower, that's the flower that the umbrella plant sends up before it shoots up these huge leaves. So that's a favorite of mine. That beautiful little pink flower shows up early in the spring. Elephant ears would be a great option. Elephant ears grow so fast, it's crazy. And then the leaves just keep coming one bigger than the next. So if you have a happy elephant plant growing in your garden, you'll be pleased with the display. Now, elephant ears grow from tubers. I would tell you to look for the ones that clump instead of run. And if you do get an elephant ear that's a runner variety, put it in a pot so that it doesn't get away from you. And don't forget, you can propagate elephant ears just by dividing up the tubers or the bulbs at the end of the growing season. You have to do it anyway if you live in a cold climate, so why not make more? So if you're in a zone six or lower, you're going to need to dig up your elephant ears before it freezes. And then you just dig up those tubers and then you save them and you'll replant them in the spring. Another fun plant with big leaves is the bed of nails plant. This plant looks super cool. It can grow up to four feet wide in a season. It's got these huge leaves. And then on the leaves, it's got these little spikes that look like it's the, each of the leaves is a bed of nails. It's quite the plant. It's very easy to grow. You can even grow it from seed. And it is absolutely stunning in the garden. And then finally, don't forget about castor bean. Castor bean is, of course, deadly poisonous. But they are absolutely gorgeous. You can just so easily sow them outside, grow them from seed. They grow super fast. These can be a real bear to take down because they're tough. But talk about huge leaves, super tall plant, definitely anchoring the garden is castor bean. 
All right, we talked about our plan for how to make a new garden look old, and we're going to keep in mind that we want to have a haphazard, evolved look, so how the garden first starts out as you're approaching the garden, and then how it ends as you go deeper into the garden will be a little bit different. It won't be totally matchy-matchy. And we said that we were going to anchor the garden at every turn, every chance we got. So we started to incorporate big plant material items like trees, evergreens, and shrubs, taller perennials and plants, plants with large leaves. Now let's look at anchoring the garden with other items. You know, one of my favorite additions to my garden in the past couple of years has been a path. I put in a simple gravel path that starts at the end of the property. It actually comes up along the driveway, which was extra bonus for us because with more drivers now, with young drivers, instead of having them just drive on the grass, now if they miss the driveway, they'll be able to hit that gravel path. And so we won't have those marks on the yard anymore. But paths really help anchor the garden. And one of the ways that you can give your path a sense of age is to use older materials for your paths and your edging if you can find them. You can do things like bricks or pavers. I think the gravel pathways, like my granite gravel, also conveys this sense of age and definitely is an anchor in the garden. It's got that heaviness to it. And then my granite gravel is edged with Chilton. And I think stone is one of the best choices you can make in terms of establishing that old feeling in your garden. You know, we brought in lots of Chilton to help terrace the backyard. It was on such a steep slope. And then we leveled it out and we put a lot of bluestone patios in and around the property. And all of that has really helped to not only anchor the garden, but create that warmth and actually a bona fide microclimate in our southern garden because we have that stone that just can absorb the heat of the sun. And there are so many plants that I have back there that really have no business growing in this garden. They're more zone five type plants, and yet they come back year after year after year, thanks to the warmth of that stone. But that bluestone and that Chilton, that edging that we've used, have really helped to establish my garden. I think dry stone walls can be the perfect element in a landscape. So if you're able to incorporate that. I had a gentleman about 10, 12 years ago just bring me about 20 boulders. And as he did that, he'd just pop on over and we'd just place them in the garden. And they would give me a place to stand or sit when I was working in that particular bed. And then they just added that element, that element of permanence of settling down. And he worked really hard with me. We would nestle those things in and we would spin them around and I'd step back and we'd work with them again. And it's not always fun. I mean, those things are really heavy. But if you've got someone that can help you and you can add boulders, things like that to your property, it really does help anchor the garden. Now, when I'm looking for especially large pieces of stone, I'm looking at bringing in boulders that have either a nice sitting surface, so whether it's smooth or whether it's flat. And I incorporated those not only throughout the garden, but also along my water feature. So I didn't want jagged rocks that the kids and I couldn't sit on because I knew that one of the things we were naturally going to want to do was sit by the water feature and put our feet in. So I made sure that at least in about six to eight different areas, there were places where we could sit and just put our feet in the water. It was wonderful. Now, if you get a chance to go out and pick your stone, if you're picking your boulders, select ones that look weathered, that look old. I actually don't like it if mine are too shiny or too stark white. I'm looking for things that are a little more worn, that have that patina of age to help anchor my garden. 
Now, let's say you have a relatively new stone wall that was just installed and you want to age it. You want to make that new stone retaining wall look old before its time. One of the things you can do is create a sort of muddy soup mixture using soil and water and then apply that to the front of the stone to add that dirt and grime, that layer of age that you want to see in an older garden. Now let that mixture dry and then you can go back over it with a bristle brush if you want to kind of tidy it up or I generally just leave it and let nature wash off whatever extra sediment remains. Then the other thing I like to do is to take soil and tuck it into the nooks and crannies to give some of the things that are either going to self-seed or things that I'd like to plant a place to grow. So for instance, I like to tuck succulents in there. I will add a little bit of soil because they don't need a lot of soil, but I'll put a little bit of soil in there and then tuck succulents or things like Creeping Jenny or other types of ground covers look great in there. Sometimes I'll make a little pocket and put a clematis in there or a clematis, depending on how you like to say it. Um, anything that vines or trails is a great thing to put in those retaining walls. Use some discretion. It doesn't have to be in every single nook and cranny, but every now and then it's nice to see something like that kind of creeping into the pathway. You can distress your stone a little bit if it looks too smooth or too perfect. You can distress it with something like a torch or a hammer, just something to add a little more character to your stone. I think when it comes to paths and walls and walkways and things like that, it looks nice if they're not too perfect because in an older garden, you're going to see plants that have jumped the edging and they're working their way into the path or you'll see things tumbling down the wall, things like that. So if it's a little bit messy, that's okay. You can add that element yourself. You don't have to wait for it. So if you have a sedum or a stone crop, something growing on one side of the edging, take some cuttings and pop it into the gravel. It'll probably be perfectly happy there. For myself, I have so much of that stuff that's already just kind of self-seeding itself or growing into my gravel pathways that when I have little open spots and containers, I'll just go around my pathway and pluck those babies out of there and then pop them in the container. And then in a few weeks, they're perfectly happy and they're growing in their container. So that's the wonderful thing about having a gravel pathway. It's really easy to pop those tiny little plants out of the gravel and then transplant them. Something else that tends to happen in established gardens is that where you see natural corners or places of rest in the garden, you'll often see groupings of containers. So that just naturally happens over time, but you can get that look a little sooner by just walking through your garden and seeing where the stop points are. Where are those little nooks and crannies where it would make sense to put a grouping of containers? And if you group them together and don't worry so much about the symmetry, just group a bunch of containers together, five to seven, you'll feel like that area is filling in. And oftentimes, I think truly one of the best things to put in those containers are your little herbs. It can be things like mint that you wouldn't necessarily want running rampant through your garden. Even pots of strawberries can look adorable all grouped together in little dead spots in your garden. You know, right now, the big box stores are going to start clearancing a lot of their plant material. They have to get so much of it out between now and the middle of July. And you'll see things like a shrub rose or even a hosta or some type of aggressive climber like a honeysuckle or a wisteria, those things look awesome in containers. And so if you get something like that on a major deal, then definitely get it, put it in a container, group them together. It'll look fantastic. I have a girlfriend who swears by this method. She gets plants on clearance and they're really just fillers for her pots and containers that are around the garden. 
Now, what she does is she just takes the pot, buries it in the winter, and then when spring rolls around again, she takes the pot and she pops it right into her container. So for the most part, she doesn't have to worry about trying to site that plant. She'll usually get a couple of years out of the plant that way. And then, of course, once it starts to get unhappy, it needs a little more space, she can always put it in her garden at that time. Now, let's talk a little bit about furniture in the garden. You know, gardens need some sense of direction and focal points, and furniture really helps anchor the garden. It draws your eye to that focal point. So whether you're talking about benches or tables and chairs, any type of seating area, those are natural areas of focus in the garden. I know a few years ago we put our fire pit in and we have the white plastic Adirondack chairs all around it and it looks absolutely gorgeous. It totally draws your eye right to it and then to make it even more magnetic, the path in two different directions leads directly to the fire pit. So whether you're coming up from the south garden along the water feature or you're walking along the front of the house going right past the beautiful front ornamental garden, all paths lead to that fire pit. And that provides such a great anchor. Not only is the fire pit an anchor itself, but then all the furniture around the fire pit, the white benches, the white Adirondack chairs, the cute little white tables, all the little containers that are nestled around there, even the area where we stockpile firewood is an anchor in the garden. The one thing I would caution you on that I think distinguishes furniture in an established garden from a new garden is scale. Oftentimes, new gardeners will grab furniture and just on a whim, that's the furniture that they have and they use, and it might not fit perfectly. It might be over scale. It might be too small. And so by spending some time in your garden, you'll get a feel for the scale of the furniture that you want to use. And we've all made this mistake, buying something and really not having a place for it or having it be too big or having it not quite look right. And I think that's something that the established gardens have over us, that they've learned through trial and error the scale of the furniture that's going to work best in their garden. So don't feel bad if you've made a bad selection, live with it a while or get rid of it and upgrade to something else. But just know that as you're trying to establish this lived in look, this very grounded look, that the scale of your furniture is going to help contribute to that anchoring and that level of comfort that you're looking for. Now, we've talked at the very beginning about not having things too matchy-matchy, and I think furniture is a way that you can do that. I have a lot of pieces in the yard that are white, but there are all kinds of different styles. In the front, there's wicker furniture. By the fire pit, there's the plastic Adirondack chairs plus white benches, and then along those are white metal tables. I have a natural teak dining set that's in the Eastern Garden. There's a white rocking wood bench in the back. The furniture on the back deck is all a walnut colored wood. My point is, is that even though there are a lot of white elements, there's all kinds of different textures different materials that make up my outdoor furniture. And that really gives it that eclectic, collected, overtime look. And then something else I think is a very nice touch that often happens in established gardens is that when they're working on their architectural structures, whether it's their pergola or their arches or arbors or trellises, they tend to coordinate with the house. So you might see the architecture echo some element of the house, some little cutout that's on the shutter, something that's at the top of all of their newel poles, things like that. I think that's a nice touch if you can incorporate things like that. I had this one side on the eastern side of our house where there was this large expanse of siding and there were no windows in this area. It was just like a big blank side of the house. And it drove me crazy because it was so enormous. 
and it just looked so dull and lifeless. So what I did is I had some guys come over and I designed this Mongo trellis and it's made up of four four by four posts that are about 20 feet high. And then we put lattice work all across it in panels. And that lattice work, that ginormous trellis really breaks up that dull blah expanse of the house. And then because it's white, it matches the trim color of the house. And then the little posts that I put at the top also match the style of the house, the the porch railings and things like that. And I think that's something that you see more in established gardens, that there's a little bit of a marriage that has happened between the garden and the house. And the established gardens tend to complement the home. And, you know, this reminds me as well, we were talking about tall plants. Well, one of the ways that you can get tall plants out of maybe average plants is to go vertical with them. So when you incorporate things like trellises, vines that would maybe normally be ramblers that you wouldn't consider to be tall plants, all of a sudden they have this vertical potential that they didn't have before. So I think trellises and arbors are way to get that vertical height that we're looking for in the established garden with plants like clematises, climbing vines, things of that nature. And the same can be said for containers. You know, once you put something in a two or three foot high pot, you've already started from a point of advantage. You know, those plants are already elevated. So that's a wonderful way to get height in the garden. And that also reminds me that when you're going to the garden center and you're looking for pots and plants and things of that nature, look for taller, bigger pieces. If you have a number of different shrubs or trees to choose from, pick the one that's the tallest. Pick the one that looks the most mature. You might as well get a jump start. I think when it comes to painting items outside, it's nice to stick to a more neutral palette. Older gardens tend to have very neutral, timeless tones. The colors that are in these gardens are meant to blend in, not overshadow. Something that you can do to make that paint process look old right from the beginning is to thin the paint. And then just the elements will create that patina of weathered wood, the the look that you're going for. It makes it much more subtle, much more delicate, but it adds this level of character to visitors that are coming to your garden. And a lot of times, think about it, if paint is thick and solid and richly colored, that's conveying newness. And it can add a stark quality that you don't want when you're trying to make a new garden look old. Lighting is another place where I think you want to exercise some discretion You can think about your lighting in terms of the style or the look that you're going for. If you have an older garden, you might want to look for lanterns or lights that have an old, timeless appeal. And of course, the goal in an older garden is that you want to provide lighting to make the garden more safe, to make it feel warm and inviting, but you don't want it to look like a runway. You don't want it to look like a new age, high tech, outdoor environment. If you're going for timeless, if you're going for that older weathered feel, incorporate that into your lighting. You want it to be subtle and not ostentatious. I would say exercise some restraint when you're incorporating lighting into an older garden. One way you can do that is to minimize the number of uplights that you're going to use, especially on structures. So don't go crazy uplighting outdoor gazebos or pergolas or things like that. Use discretion when you're placing those things and do minimal path lighting as well. Something else that's a wonderful anchor in any garden is a water feature. Water features provide such wonderful visual and audio interest. I think anytime you add water to a garden, it ups the elegance factor. So whether it's something as simple as adding a fountain or adding a full-fledged water feature, I think you'll find it has a special merit in a garden that you're trying to make look established. Be careful, though, when you're picking 
your water feature, especially if you're getting something freestanding. Sometimes they can look just too overdone, too overdesigned. We've all driven by the homes that have these enormous water features out front with like two lions on either side of it, and it just doesn't fit with the home or the neighborhood. So make sure that the pieces you're selecting for your garden are a good match. And I think that whole scale and design piece comes with time. People roll through different pieces before they finally settle on something that they know is working in their garden. And that's the difference between a brand new garden that we're trying to cobble together as best we can and a garden that we've spent a lot of time with, getting to know, getting to understand and fully appreciating the scale that works in the garden. All right, just a couple of more comments here on some other things that you can add to your garden that will help give it that established feel. And then we'll move into aging pieces in the garden prematurely, how to do that, how to age your terracotta pots or your metalwork, all of that stuff to give it that weathered, charming look that everyone loves. So before we go into that, let me just talk quickly about using vintage things, broken items, collections, that kind of thing in the garden. So when it comes to incorporating vintage things, this was a trap that I'd fallen into early because I love vintage stuff. I could just thrift shop and flea market shop till the cows come home. And what ends up happening is you can go overboard with this. And so over time, I've learned that I've had to really go through and edit these items and get them out of the garden because it can start to look a little junky, a little too mismatch, a little too careless. And that was not the look that I was going for. So as I was evolving, my garden evolved, and a lot of that stuff came out of the garden. But there are every now and then some items that I find that have a vintage quality to them that I think are wonderful accent pieces in the garden. This year I stumbled on an old farmer's market sign and it had so much character and it was so substantial that I was thrilled to get that. I have yet to place it in my garden, but I have a better eye for the scale and the look that I'm going for when I'm getting something vintage in the garden. So if you're unsure, you know, you can always ask a friend, you can ask your mom, you can ask anyone what their thoughts are on whether or not it fits in your garden, whether or not it creates the feeling that you're going for. And over time, I think you'll get better at picking those items. Now, one of my spring tasks every year is to go through the garden and pull out the items that have been weathered beyond their life, weathered beyond their usability in the garden. I'm talking about things that are now rusted through or have completely decomposed. I had this wonderful beehive basket. It's called a bee skep. It's this carefully designed domed basket. And a lot of times people just use it to decorate with, or maybe they'll cover a platter of food with it to keep the flies off it until you're ready to go eat. But anyway, I had this and I left it outside in my southern garden and it was outside for a good year, all in the elements, through the snow, through the rain, what have you. And when I went out this spring, it was disintegrating. So what I did with it is I just busted it into little pieces and I used it as a mulch cover over my bush bean garden. So it's now providing that coverage, that kind of weed barrier that I'm looking for. And so it has a whole new life that way. But I think every spring you want to do that. You want to go through your garden and pull out the things that have lived beyond their shelf life. And then, hey, as you're doing that, sometimes we learn, okay, we shouldn't get this or we shouldn't leave this outside, that kind of a thing. And that's totally fine as well. Something else I think can look really nice in an older garden is the repurposing of broken things. But I think you have to be careful here that it looks especially loved, perfectly placed, and very functional. Sometimes a great example of this would be a bird bath or a fountain that has a crack in it or a leak in it. So it can't be used in the way that it was originally intended, but you could turn it into an elevated garden. You could put succulents in it or other things. Maybe it's your cactus garden. 
you know, something like that. But oftentimes when you go through an older, more established garden, they will have used broken things to make the garden feel even more established and old. So again, I think this is something where you might want to practice some restraint. Don't just reuse everything, repurpose everything. But if you have something that is especially difficult to part with and you think it has some aesthetic value still, then go ahead and use it. Okay, the last piece here in terms of something you can add to your garden to add that age is a collection. And older gardens tend to have things as you're walking through them that you can see have been collected and pulled together over time. One of the happy accidents I stumbled into is I decided that I didn't want the collection of pots and containers that I had been accumulating because they were all different colors and all different sizes and shapes, and it just felt so discombobulated. So I saved my absolute favorites, and then I started buying terracotta pots, and terracotta pots only. So when I was at garage sales or thrift stores, or if somebody was just giving them away, which is often the case, people get tired of terracotta pots, I would buy them. And then I started to pull them together and stack them in a few strategic places in my garden. And so I always have a ready supply of terracotta pots when I need them. It's a signature look of my garden that I have so much terracotta pottery throughout my garden. And then I feel like I've shared this so many times before, but one of the ways that I like to stack my terracotta pots is I will cut up strips of burlap and I will layer it in between my terracotta pots. So I'll cut up these little strips and I'll have it be a terracotta pot upside down and then a little hunk of burlap that kind of sticks out the bottom and then another terracotta pot over that. So think about that burlap as kind of a liner inside the terracotta pot. That's the look I'm going for. I use it to help me stack those pots so that they don't stick together. I also use it as a way to prevent things from going out the bottom of that hole on the terracotta pot. And I think it looks adorable to have a little bit of burlap sticking around the edges as a liner. It's just kind of a nice little feature. And then if you want to jazz up those terracotta pots even more, you can put a little twine or a little metal wire around the outside. It just adds a little something, a little personal touch to the way you want to handle your terracotta pottery. So instead of just having that bright orange, crazy terracotta pottery that's not terribly inspiring, I like to age mine. I'm going to walk you through that in a second here. But in addition to that, I add a lot of little touches, such as the burlap, such as the twine, things like that. And I do things like taking that terracotta pot and I'll lash it to a fence post and I'll put some silverware inside it so that I have a utensil that I can use to quickly weed if I have to, if I'm just going around. I'll put some serrated knives in there, things like that. If you have little kids, you might not want to do it. I, I'm beyond that point right now. And it's so handy for me to have that in a few places in my garden. And I really like it. So the terracotta pots is the collection that's probably the most recognizable in my garden. And then there are a number of one-of-a-kind finds like that farmer's market sign or the fountains that I scour Craigslist for. You know, about three years ago, I bought this huge cement planter that had this base that I think it took six high school boys to move for me and then this ginormous scalloped top. And it's right at the front of my property underneath the locust tree. And I always laugh because it's close enough to the edge that if my neighbor was backing their car out, they could hit this scalloped planter. And I think the planter would win. It's that solid. And the other thing I have often imagined is whether a snow truck would inadvertently hit it in the winter as it's going through and clearing the streets. It is just so massive. I think it could give the snowplow a run for its money. But something like that, some of these one-of-a-kind pieces that have this very weathered look, this very loved look, have really helped to anchor my garden and give it that established feel. 
All right, now it's time for the fun part of the show, and we're going to talk about different ways that you can age some of the materials that are in your garden. My first and favorite project is aging my terracotta pots. You can completely make your container garden look old with aged terracotta pots. Now, if you buy them in the store this way, they can cost a fortune, but you can make your new terracotta pots look like they have been sitting in the garden for a very long time using this technique. And what you want to buy is garden lime. So, I'm going to jump on Amazon right now with you. If you're at home, you can do this with me, but let's go up to the search bar and we're going to type in garden lime. And you'll see it there. The one that I like to buy is from a Spoma. It's the GL6 garden lime soil amendment. It's the 6.75 pound bag. Now I have so many terracotta pots that I will usually buy two, but I would say start out with one, see if you like it. See if you think this process is worthwhile. Now, are you sitting down? I'm going to tell you the the cost of this garden lime. It's $3.92. That's right. So for four bucks, you can get this key ingredient that you're going to need to make your terracotta pots look old instead of that new kind of stark orange. So let's start by getting that taken care of. The next thing you're going to want to do is while you're on Amazon, go and look for those foam brushes. Now, I like to buy the 20-pack because I use them all the time. So when you search for foam brushes, there's going to be a bestseller that comes up. And what's crazy is that these foam brushes, you get 20 in a pack, they're $5.23. So you'll have enough to work on your terracotta pots all summer long, and then you can just throw the brush away and you're done. Super easy. So I love it. So they're $5.23. It's the two inch foam brush there. I just added it to my cart. So that's on the way as well. Now what you're going to do is you're going to take that garden lime when it comes and you're going to put it in. I use an old ice cream bucket. So I throw the garden lime in there. I'll take a cup of garden lime and then I'll take a cup of water. So it's a one to one ratio. So Half of your mixture is going to be this garden lime and half of your mixture is going to be the water and you're going to stir it together with a paint stick. You can get those free at any of the big box stores and that's it. Now, sometimes I'll create a bigger batch because remember, I like to use the ice cream bucket. So if I have an ice cream bucket, I might put like four or five cups of water in there and then four or five cups of the garden lime and I'll mix that together and then I'll take tongs you know I love to get the tongs from the thrift stores and I'll just grab the pot with the tongs especially those littler terracotta pots and I'll dunk it in there now for the bigger pots I'm going to use those foam brushes and I'm going to apply it that way but here's the main thing you want to completely cover the surface area of this terracotta pot with a thick layer of the lime water mixture. And if you want, you can do it again. You can do a second layer. So sometimes after I've dunked those littler containers, I'll come back, I'll set them in the sun, have them be drying, and then I'll come back through and I'll do it again. I'll dunk them again. Now, once they're dry after their second or third coat, I just take a piece of sandpaper, and I just rough these pots up a little bit. First of all, you're going to be super happy with the color that they are after they've gotten painted with this garden lime. It's fantastic. But when that piece is done, you're going to want to sand some of it off. Not too much, because the next step is you're going to want to seal it. And when you seal the pot with this spray that I'm going to have you use, that will actually remove some of the lime as well. So don't go too crazy with the sanding. Just sand it a little bit, rough it up a little bit, and then the next step is to seal it. Now, I like to use a matte finish spray. I either use the Krylon Aerosol Matte Satin Finish Spray. So if you're on Amazon, it's about 10 bucks. The other brand I like is that Aileen's Spray Acrylic Sealer Matte Finish. 
That's available on Amazon as well. You can also find it at Target or Walmart. It's about half the price of the Krylon. It's about six bucks, but it's also about half the size. So either way, this is probably the most expensive part of this project. But I will go over it just very lightly with this spray, just to make sure that it stays on, that that garden lime stays there and doesn't just wash off. And what I like to do is not spray the inside of the pot. And I do only want to lightly spray the outside of the pot because otherwise what happens is you will make it so that that pot won't absorb moisture. And that defeats the whole purpose of using a terracotta pot. Plus, I'm not as concerned with that lime coming off because over time, if that starts to deteriorate, I'll just dip it again. I'll just add another coat in another couple of years. And the whole time that pot is continuing to weather and age and lose that orange exterior. So I like that. Now, of course, you can use the method that many people do to make either their stones or their hypertufa look old. And what you do here is you create that buttermilk mixture with moss. So this works well if you have a blender that you don't care about and that you can use to take some buttermilk and some yogurt with some moss and you basically mix that mixture together in the blender and then you paint it onto your hypertufa or you put it on rocks and the next thing you know you'll have moss growing on those items and that gives a nice old look to your garden as well. I had a friend do that with steppers in her shade garden and it worked really nice. You know another thing you can do to age metal in your garden is of course add vinegar. Vinegar will a lot of times help things begin to tarnish and to age. And then I mentioned earlier that when it comes to a lot of your wooden pieces outside, you can use thinner coats of very neutral paint. You can incorporate things like milk paint and stains, things to give it that weathered look the goal, though, is to keep it very thin and to sand as you go to add that weathered patina. OK, we're almost to the end. We're going to wrap up here by talking about how you can age new cement statues in the garden. I get a lot of my statues and my fountains on Craigslist, so sometimes they come with that built-in weathered look already there. But sometimes you get something and it's so stark white, it's just not pleasant to look at in the garden. This is a way that you can easily age this new cement statuary that you have in your garden. So one of the things that we're going to do is go back to Amazon and we're going to look for or an item that's called liquid cement color. And it's by Quickrete. And we are going to find the one that is charcoal colored. Let me just pull this up here a second. Okay. So we're looking for a Quickrete liquid cement color. It's 10 ounces and it's in charcoal and it's $5.93. So not a huge investment. And then the other thing we're looking for is the Quickrete Concrete Bonding Adhesive. This is $8.97 for the quart, and that's on Amazon as well. And so you order those two things, and then here's what you're going to do. First, you're going to get a spray bottle, and you're just going to fill it with water. So that's easy. Then you're going to want to get a bucket that you can use to put your mixture in. And I recommend wearing gloves as well. So I always wear gloves, but just in case, you're going to want to make sure you're wearing gloves as well. Have a paintbrush and have a rag that you can use. And so the first thing you're going to do is in your bucket, you're going to mix three things together. You're going to mix the two things that you just got off of Amazon, your concrete bonding adhesive and your charcoal colored pigment, the Quickrete liquid cement color that's in charcoal. And you'll put one pint of clear water in the bucket with a half a pint of the concrete bonding adhesive and then two tablespoons of the charcoal colored pigment. You'll mix that together 
and then you're going to head on over to your statue with your spray bottle and your mixture. So you go to your statue, you spray it down with water, you spray the area that you want to work on. So let's say that you're working on a cherub and we're going to work on the cherub's face first. So you spray down the face, you pre-wet your statue, and because you're pre-wetting it, it's going to stop this solution that you're going to paint on from soaking in too fast and making it look blotchy. You don't want that. So make sure you soak it down first with the spray bottle. Then you're going to take your paintbrush, dip it into that mixture, and apply it to the area that you've just wet down. And then take your rag and immediately wipe down any of the areas that are higher, any of the standout areas of the statue. So if we were, let's say we were doing the cherub's face, well, we'd immediately take the rag and I kind of just go over it very lightly on the top and I'll brush the cheeks and the tip of the nose and the eyebrows, kind of like if I was doing makeup, I would hit the highlights, hit the high areas. Because those high points are always lighter in color on a statue than the crevices, than the areas that are the low points, the accent areas, the areas that give the statue definition. And that's basically it. You're going to go across the entire statue using this method. Places where you want more accent color, you want that deeper color would be in like the crook of the arm, in the elbow, wherever there are creases, you can definitely apply more of the pigment to give it more definition. Now, what's great about applying this treatment to your statues is that all those little details that can sometimes get lost when your statue is just a glaring white piece you can all of a sudden see the little details, the little flowers that are in the hand, the details in the face or the tunic or whatever it is that you're working with. And never fear if the item that you're working with has a chip or a scratch or some type of mark on it. I think it only adds to the charm. Anyway, there are so many options out there for aging items in the garden. You can just go on YouTube and watch an endless array of videos that are all about aging items in the garden. You can do things from painting your terracotta pots to applying moss. There's all types of ingredients and recipes and applications. So if these don't appeal to you, go out there and explore a little bit. You just might hit on the method that really works for you and your garden. I'm just sharing with you the couple of things that I prefer to do in my garden. Plus, I like it when I can get the ingredients on Amazon quickly, easily, affordably because everything around here moves so fast that if it doesn't literally come to my front door, sometimes it just is not going to get done. So I figure half the battle is just getting the supplies that I need delivered right to my front door. Well, that's it for our show today on how to make your new garden feel older. I think we covered it all. We covered a lot of ground. We started out with that initial plan where we're keeping two key things in mind. The first is that we want to develop an evolved look over time. We don't want it to be matchy-matchy. We don't want it to look too put together. We'd like it to be a little haphazard and evolved. And then, of course, we're focusing on the things that will anchor our garden, the bones of our garden, and we'll put off purchasing things that are not in that category. So when we look down at our shopping cart, we'll see that we're investing the majority of our gardening budget on the things that will give us that older feel faster if we invest in them now. So we talked about touring gardens to create new ideas for our own spaces, standing on the shoulders of giants. If you're in a garden that you absolutely love, take pictures, chronicle it, talk to the homeowner, ask them about the things that they've invested in that have had the biggest payoff for them, and then copy and paste those ideas into your own garden. They're going to be uniquely yours by the time you're done with them anyway. We talked about how to curate the best plant selections for that lush look that we all love from taller plants to plants with bigger leaves, with bigger plant mass. We talked about implementing the common garden aesthetics that are found in older gardens, whether it's the furniture or the vintage things, the lighting, the paint, the structures, the collections that make up these 
elements that we find in older gardens. And then, of course, we wrapped things up by taking matters into our own hands, actually aging our own materials, our pots, metalwork, wood items, and statuary for that weathered and distinguished look that is only offered by established gardens. I hope this episode made you feel excited to give some of these ideas a try. And even if you have an older garden, some of these tips can reinvigorate and bring new life into older spaces. I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions for helping me put this episode together, my fabulous editor, Eric Begay, Ayn Kadena, my show notes creator, and David Gregerson, my project manager. And just a reminder, I'll have all of the generous information that I shared on the show today over at the Still Growing Podcast page on my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A dot com. I want to thank the listeners that are in my listener community on Facebook. That's the Still Growing Podcast Group. So if you'd like to join that group, just head on over to Facebook and type in Still Growing Podcast Group in the search bar, and then our group will pop right up. You can click on it, request to join, and then you'll get all of the wonderful articles that make up the Garden News Roundup, in addition to being able to participate in the listener community with other listeners and guests of the show. I want to make sure that I thank the listeners that make up my listener advisory board, Beth Engel, Denise Pugh, Denise Gardens in North Mississippi and is a contributing writer to Mississippi Gardener Magazine, Amy Von Atchen, Patricia Chandler Newport. Patricia is the owner of Backyard Urban Gardens, and she is based in Kego Harbor, Michigan. Deb Gibson and Peggy Ann Montgomery. Peggy Ann Montgomery is the brand manager at American Beauty's Native Plants. And of course, she was featured back in episode 553, where she talked all about native plants. And I hope that you're incorporating more native plants into your landscape this summer. Well, I'd love to see the ways that you are creating history in your own garden by incorporating some of these ideas and generating more comfort, more security, more elegance and sophistication for your own little piece of heaven on earth. And see if some of these ideas don't help your garden feel just a little bit older, just a little bit more established and secure. Have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a SixFootMama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. 